Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I have a friend who worked as a forest ranger in the U.S. for a few years. He's told me some freaky stories about what he's found at work. I'm convinced that neither all forest rangers are in on this huge inside joke to tell the most crazy stories about their work to anybody who asks about it, nor that the woods hide much more than one would think. One of his stories that's always living rent-free in my head is when he told me about this weird pit that he found in the middle of the woods. He said that they had received reports of this dug-up pit. Apparently, some colleagues had found it while patrolling, a huge, large pit in the middle of the woods. He went to check it out, and sure enough, the pit was there, just a hole in the floor about the size of a car. But right in the middle of the pit, there was a vintage record player, just there. He picked it up, and it seemed to be in mint condition. He took it to his office. The other rangers there just filled it up, and nobody ever came to ask about the record player, so he kept it. Next week, they got a complaint from their superiors as to why nobody had filled the pit yet. Confused, my friend assured them that he and his colleagues had already filled it up. They assured them that the pit was still there. They were sent to inspect, and sure enough, it was again as if nobody had even touched it, no trace of the dirt that they had even put on top of it. There was only one difference this time, in the middle of it, one of those very vintage cigarette cases. My friend picked it up and once again filled the pit, figuring somebody must be up to some funny business here, maybe some rituals or something, but none of it made sense. Again, nobody asked about the cigarette case, not that he'd expect to, so he kept it. A few days go by, and they get a report the pit is back again. Now they're having none of it. They go and carry a small security camera, strapping it to a nearby tree, finally catching the pit digging maniac. When they get there, they find a small, old looking, leather bound notebook. Once again, my friend grabs it, takes it with him. They install the camera, fill up the pit, and leave. The pit never came back once the camera was placed. Whoever was digging it chickened out and left it alone. However, my friend's curiosity did not die there. He took the things to an expert and confirmed they were all genuine and in an extremely good condition, a weird place for a vintage collector to store his treasures. But the strangest thing of all was that he found the journal. He opened it up and found a newspaper cutout. It read April 17, 1972, and on the journal, there's only one phrase written, it worked. Another story he told me is about this kid that had come stumbling out of the woods one day. He was somewhat dirty, but it just looked like a normal amount of dirt as a kid would have after playing around all day. He was wearing a t-shirt and jeans, so nothing out of the ordinary. When the rangers found him, they took him to one of their offices to ask about his parents, how he ended up there. The kid answered he was just playing in the woods and got distracted by chasing a beetle. He had lost his parents and his brother and ended up where they found him. He seemed completely normal, but when he spoke, he had a strange accent, as if English wasn't his mother tongue but had learned it very well. They asked for the name of his parents, and he replied they were called K-98 and D-54. They insisted on the real names, but the kid kept repeating those numbers and did not know what the rangers meant. They asked if he knew their phone numbers but the kid didn't seem to know what a phone was. He just seemed to slowly get more and more nervous. They kept asking him things to try and help him, about how long ago he had got lost, if he knew exactly where he was before, if he could remember where he had his parents and where they parked their car, where he was from, but the kid answered nothing, all those words, he seemed to have never heard them before. He seemed to be completely lost about it. Suddenly, the kid gets up, said that he had made a big mistake, and promptly exited the office, running. The rangers ran after him, but he was fast. He went into the woods and vanished, leaving no trace behind. The rangers went straight inside, but the kid was gone after searching all afternoon. They figured they were going to need help, they called in search and rescue, conducted extensive searching, 
covering much of the terrain as they could. They never found anything, not even footsteps. Everybody was ready for the parents to show up and ask about their kid at any moment. They never did. Missing posters were placed with his description, also shared on social media. The police even got involved at some point, but the child was never heard from again. Slowly, the search died out, he became a missing person report, no photo, address, or name to go by, just an extremely generic physical description and the name of his parents, K98 and D54. My friend said it became some sort of taboo topic. Nobody wants to think where a lost kid in the forest ended up. The thing is, even if my friend is sure nobody will ever find out what happened, he is convinced that kid was not lost in the woods but somehow placed there, perhaps his parents were alien. It's interesting, the whole case surrounding it. After the search died off, everything on social media was pulled, any documentation released was now redacted. Something about it is very, very fishy. On a night in 2006 or 2007, I guess, I noticed a campfire in the distance, and I went to investigate as setting up camps in this area was not allowed due to conservation efforts being in place. I walked over, no one was there, and I thought, what idiots would leave a fire unattended? So, I went closer, there were about two tents from what I remember and no one there. I radioed in and asked for a couple of guys to come to clean up. When they arrived, I went to look for any sign that people were around. I looked around for a couple of minutes but didn't find anything. Then we all left after extinguishing the fire and clearing up, we had one guy stay there as we had unattended equipment. Then I went back to the office, I was due a break. After the break, I went out and saw a group of three who seemed fairly distressed. I approached them and asked them what they were doing down in this neck of the woods, and they said that they were camping and had been told to leave their campsite immediately. I became suspicious as we had no rangers working there. I asked them who they saw, and they said that he was wearing very old-fashioned clothes and supposedly had no face. At this point, shivers were sent down my spine. I told them to go and collect their equipment, and they went to get their equipment. Then I saw them leaving. I have only mentioned this to my friend who works in the park since 2006. He hasn't had any reports of such a thing up to this day. This is one of my scariest stories. I still have no clue what happened, but hearing that in the dark and in the middle of the woods sent shivers down my spine. It was dead of winter, the park was closed, and I was car camping in the south rim in a designated campsite. There was no one around, not even a park ranger. After driving around the campground twice to find a spot that felt alright it felt like the sun set way quicker than usual. After the sun set, I put away all the food in a bear locker for the night, and went in my car to read. I had the car light on, and had a really eerie, dreadful feeling that with the light on, I couldn't see outside but anything could see inside. I was to the right of a giant shrub bush, which made me unusually uncomfortable, lacking the protected feeling you get amongst evergreens and spruces and the like. There was a full moon, and it was illuminating movement and rustling in the bush and, call me a wuss, immediately hightailed it out of there, didn't need to hang around for the rest. I drove into town for the night to park and sleep in my car on a side street. I found a park, on a dead-end street, and managed to park with one side of my car to the park, and the trunk to the dead end, so that two-fourth sides of my car were up against a sidewalk or end. Nothing too strange happened that night, but I swear I slept in 45-minute intervals max, and had recurring dreams of some very hard-to-make-out human-like figure actually in the park I was parked up against. The next morning, I went up to the campsite to collect the food I left behind. I had a terrible feeling the whole way up and just really didn't want to go back. A park ranger was at the lodge, which felt semi-strange, like the park just turned on again, and I walked in to use the restroom. In short, 
I told him I had a strange experience the night prior and he just graced me with a I believe it. I went to the bear locker, gathered all the food, and before leaving decided to walk around. As I mentioned, it was dead of winter, and snow had just fallen. There were two, impossible to determine the animal or human, fresh footprints behind the shrub. Booked it out of there so quick. I don't know what it was, but I just felt it didn't want me there, and almost as if I were trespassing in its space. I have zero desire to go back to the Black Canyon. Bear with me, this happened a long, long time ago, so the specifics of when and where have kind of escaped me, but the rest of what I saw is something that I can never forget, even almost 40 years ago. For the longest time, I had no words for this thing other than werewolf, even though what I saw was in the middle of the day. And for years, I only told a couple of people because I didn't want anyone to think that I was a kook. I told my friend that was there about what happened. I think this thing was actually chasing him when it all went down. He didn't really seem to believe me, he thought it had to be something else, anything else, really, because werewolves don't exist, right? Well, my friend, if this makes it to your channel and there's anyone that agrees that they don't exist, they're wrong, plain and simple. They are dead wrong. I saw one. I know what I saw. I know it wasn't anything else but a werewolf or at least something similar in appearance. So let me set the stage for you, and I'll do that as best as I can remember. I'd call on my friend Billy, who was the other person there at the time, but sadly, cancer took him several years ago. So the details that I can give you are the only ones that I myself can remember. My mind isn't what it used to be. Maybe I remember what this thing looked like and what it was doing so vividly that I forgot the more insignificant parts. I'm pretty sure that it was in 1983. I know it was summertime, August, if I'm not mistaken. So that would put me at 25 years old, if that's the right year. I know it was before either of us met our ladies, so everything before that is kind of hard to keep track of, and honestly, it doesn't really matter what happened before meeting them. I know it happened in Ohio, but for the life of me, I can't remember which part. I wasn't from the area, we were just passing through on our way to a weekend show for classic cars. My cousin Jim had told me about it. He knew that both myself and Billy were very proud of our rides and figured we'd jump at the chance to show them off, plus I hadn't been to visit Jim in a good long while, so Billy and I packed up for the adventure and set out for a good time. We were both living in Kendallville, Indiana, at the time, and we were driving to Pittsburgh for the show, so it was going to be a long drive, but we were up for the road trip. I just wish we hadn't picked that damn road to drive down when all this happened. Still, I guess it opened my eyes to what could really be out there, and we both made it out alive, so it could be worse. I was driving my 1953 Chevy Bel Air that I remember clearly, she was beautiful. Billy was driving his 1965 F100, and he was in front of me. Wherever we were looked like just a back road that takes you away from civilization, one of those roads where you only see another car every so often. We hadn't seen another soul for miles, and honestly, I was getting a little bored and kind of antsy. We'd been on the road all day long, and I just wanted to get to our destination already, even though I knew that we weren't going to be in Pittsburgh that day. We still had a few hours worth of driving to get to where we were going for the night, and Billy was just cruising along, going slower than I would like. But if I was in front, I'd be going faster than he'd like, so he insisted that he lead. Where we were at was in the middle of this cornfield, I remember the corn on both sides of the road very Texas chainsaw if you ask me. I didn't get out to see clearly, but the corn itself looked taller than me, and I come in at six foot one so I put the corn at at least 7 feet tall, who knows, might have even been taller than that. That's why I was bored, you see, because nothing but corn as far as the eye could see. I think I was even just zoning out and just focusing on the road lines, and then out of the blue, I realized that something was running through the corn, it was in between Billy and myself, and it looked like it was chasing after his truck. I was intrigued, 
It looked big and upright, so I knew it wasn't some kind of animal, and honestly, I wasn't even sure what kind of animals were in Ohio, if I was being completely honest, we were from Indiana and just passing through. So I just watched what I thought was a very large man chasing after Billy's truck. Now keep in mind, this thing was still in the corn all the while, so seeing the details was hard to do. I thought to myself that this guy was very, very fast because we were going about 40 miles per hour or so, like I said, Billy was going slower than I would be. Still, though, you show me any man that can keep pace at 40 miles per hour, that's just not going to happen. There wasn't anything else to do but watch the situation unfold, so I just drove along, keeping an eye on the road and the other on my mystery creature over there. The more I watched, though, the more unnerved I started to feel, and I couldn't explain it, I just felt like something was wrong or something bad was going to happen. And then this stone cold dread came over my entire body, I remember feeling the chills and my stomach falling, my heart picking up pace. I kept looking over at this thing, and eventually, I started to get little peeks of what this thing actually looked like, and when I started putting the details together, I damn near myself. Like I said, my initial belief was that I was staring at an honest to god werewolf, this creature was too big and too fast to be a person and I realized that I could see the top of its head bobbing through the top of the corn every now and then, that would put it at at least 7 feet tall, and what I was seeing on the top of the corn looked like ears, like canine ears. I tried to keep pace with this thing as best as I could without tailgating Billy, I wanted to get a better look at it, but I was afraid that if I did start tailgating that he'd pull over and ask me what my problem was and stopping right now in the middle of nowhere with some kind of beast on our tail was the last thing that I wanted to happen. I didn't want this thing to run into us without the safety of our vehicles, but I kept looking over, getting as much detail as I could, and here's what I remember, it looked like a damn wolf running on two legs. It was covered in dark hair, I'm not sure if it was black or brown or even if it was just the shadows of the corn that made it seem darker, but I knew that it was covered in hair from the top of its head all the way down to its feet. I know it had a canine muzzle because I could see glances of it as it passed through the stalks of corn, and it moved its arms back and forth like a man when it ran, bent at the elbows, swinging to and fro, front to back. The strides that this thing took were incredible, I mean, it was sprinting at 40 miles per hour, and it made it look easy. It was also very large, as in muscular, even in the corn stalks, I could appreciate that. With your series of questions that you sent me, you asked me for details like eye color, whether or not it had a tail, and how it stood on its feet, but unfortunately, the corn made a lot of those details obscured. At one point, though, I do believe that it looked over at me like it was curious or angry even or maybe even sizing me up as if to chase me instead of Billy. I just know that at the point where I feel it looked at me, it looked directly at me, like through my window, and made eye contact. I couldn't see his eyes, but I felt that this thing fit mine, if that makes any sense at all, and that's when I started to absolutely panic. I got this feeling that if we didn't get out of there fast, our lives would be in danger, this thing just gave the overall impression of being completely lethal, it was an apex predator for sure. It looked like it was built for killing, and I don't think that an upright canine running through a cornfield in the middle of nowhere was just doing it for kicks. I remember wondering where the hell this thing could have come from. I asked myself what could even stop it if it decided to attack. These were thoughts that I needed to know because all I could do was watch. I felt absolutely helpless there in my car as this thing just kept speed with us. I needed to get out of there because as far as I knew, Billy wasn't even aware of this thing, so I felt responsible for my life and his. If I honked, he might stop thinking that something was wrong with the Chevy, if we stopped, I was sure it would kill us both, at this point, it had been over 2 miles, and it maintained this chase. As far as I know, nothing else can do that at that speed for that amount of time, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anything on this earth has the capability of doing that. I was already convinced it was a werewolf at this point, and I wasn't going to do anything that might cause us to die at the hands of this thing. 
I could still see it keeping up with us, not giving any indication that it was getting tired, and then I guess I kind of stopped paying attention to it because I was more focused on how to get us out of there, but I did keep glancing over at it, and it stayed with us the whole time, then I finally figured out what I could do to get him moving faster. I made sure that nobody else was coming on the opposite side of the road, I guess that was the one nice thing about being out there, you could see for miles, when I was sure that nobody was coming down the road the other way, I swerved over and sped up, pulling up to Billy's window. I started waving frantically and motioning for him to get going and not to stop, I was trying my best to make motions with my hands that could be interpreted as we need to get the hell out of there. I was trying my best to make sure he knew how important it was to listen to me. I think he saw how afraid I was, and maybe that's what kicked him into gear because luckily, he got the idea and sped up his truck. I slowed back down a little and went back to driving behind him. For a minute, I thought this thing was going to keep up with us because as we increased our speed, so did that thing. My heart was beating so fast, I was thinking, how fast can this thing actually move? Are we ever going to be able to lose it? But I guess it was too much for it because it started slowing down, and then it looked like it turned and went further into the corn, and that's when I lost sight of it. I floored the gas to get the hell out of there because Billy was now actually a little further ahead of me. We drove for another good while before we pulled off and back into civilization. I told him everything that I saw and he just laughed and asked me if I was token a J in the Chevy while we were cruising back there, I was kind of mad that he didn't believe me. I told him no, I wasn't stoned, I was completely sober during the whole damn incident. He shrugged it off and told me that it had to be something else because there's no such thing as werewolves. We went on our trip and didn't really talk about it much, but it was really weighing on my mind for a long time after that. I talked to him about it for years and years, but I don't know if he ever really believed me, he used to joke about it with me, although he never came out right and told me that he didn't believe me, I guess now I'll never know. God rest his soul. Over the years, I started telling more and more people, I didn't have anything to lose, really, and it happened a really long time ago. I just wish I could remember exactly where it happened so I could give you that location. The Okefenokee, Okefenokee, swamp is located mostly in South Georgia and partly in North Florida. I've been going there since I was a kid, my dad and uncle were avid outdoorsmen. They were always canoeing, hiking, hunting, fishing, etc., and I grew up learning to love the same things. Now, if the first thing that came to your mind when I said swamp was alligators, you would be correct and the Okefenokee has some of the biggest around. It may sound super scary to non-Southerners, but the old saying really is true, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Canoeing slowly across the dark, tea-colored waters, if you pass too closely to one, it will quietly slink into the murky depths. He's not coming to get you, you've simply interrupted his sunbathing. As elementary school kids in South Georgia, it was kind of a rite of passage to go on the Okefenokee field trip and be led on a guided tour by Okefenokee Joe. Joe was a true outdoorsman, extremely knowledgeable, friendly, good with the kids and funny. A little strange, but generally regarded as a good guy. A local legend. He would get that boat closer to the big gators than my dad ever let me get. He taught us kids all about them. We even got to hear the mating call of some of the males and watch a lot of their behavior up close. He would also show us all the birds, snakes, and other wildlife. The swamp's residents were so used to Joe's boat that they didn't flee when he got close. Great memories. Anyhow, fast forward to my adulthood and I still have a great love for the outdoors. I'd recently gotten married and was successfully getting my wife and stepdaughter into kayaking, camping and hiking. I'd broken them in fairly easy, calm lakes and beautiful crystal clear blue spring-fed Florida waterways. We'd encountered some gators, but the girls had already become comfortable with the fact that they don't want to hurt humans. I decided it was time to go out to the Okefenokee and show them my childhood swamp stomping grounds. We headed out one weekend, 
Kind of on a whim, I hadn't called ahead to reserve a campsite because I assumed it wouldn't be that busy yet. Well, I was wrong. Every tent camping site was booked. I was pretty visibly bummed out so I guess the ranger felt sorry for me. She told us to hold on, she was going to check one more thing. When she came back she had great news. There was a primitive group site available. If you aren't familiar, these are larger sites that are usually for big groups like Boy Scouts, usually situated away from the main campground areas. They do not have electricity. We camp 100% primitive all the time, so this wasn't an issue for us at all. The ranger explained that this particular group site had been closed for two seasons due to the road being washed out. She said they had just fixed the road the week before, but hadn't gotten around to relisting the site as available. She offered to sell it to us for a normal fee instead of the group fee. Deal. We pay and she vaguely shows us on the map how to get to our home for the night. I remember thinking damn that's far as hell from all the other sites, it's gonna be nice and quiet. Perfect. While at the office we learned that that evening there was going to be a ranger guided night paddle. This particular park inside the Okefenokee is a designated dark sky park, meaning there is very little light pollution. I was already excited about showing my family the stars and Milky Way, so getting out onto the water at night and seeing the skies that way sounded sweet. We decided to sign up for the night paddle and then headed off to find our campsite. Part 2. Well, I was wrong. Every tent camping site was booked. I was pretty visibly bummed out so I guess the ranger felt sorry for me. She told us to hold on, she was going to check one more thing. When she came back she had great news. There was a primitive group site available. If you aren't familiar, these are larger sites that are usually for big groups like Boy Scouts, usually situated away from the main campground areas. They do not have electricity. We camp 100% primitive all the time, so this wasn't an issue for us at all. The ranger explained that this particular group site had been closed for two seasons due to the road being washed out. She said they had just fixed the road the week before, but hadn't gotten around to relisting the site as available. She offered to sell it to us for a normal fee instead of the group fee. Deal. We pay and she vaguely shows us on the map how to get to our home for the night. I remember thinking damn that's far as hell from all the other sites, it's gonna be nice and quiet. Perfect. While at the office we learned that that evening there was going to be a ranger guided night paddle. This particular park inside the Okefenokee is a designated dark sky park, meaning there is very little light pollution. I was already excited about showing my family the stars and Milky Way, so getting out onto the water at night and seeing the skies that way sounded sweet. We decided to sign up for the night paddle and then headed off to find our campsite. When we got there you could tell right away that the area hadn't been used in several years. Overgrown, spider webs everywhere, teeming with the usual wildlife. I kind of prefer things this way, so I didn't think twice about it. It was so far from the campgrounds and the main office area, you couldn't hear a single sound of humans or vehicles. The area was large so I walked around a bit to find a good spot to set up. I looked back at my map to try and gauge exactly how this little island was shaped, and noticed that what I was seeing and what the map showed didn't quite line up. Whatever, I'm sure I'm just reading it wrong. We set up our camp and just enjoyed the sunshine and the sounds of nature. It was still very early spring, so the hordes of mosquitoes and various other swamp bugs weren't out in full force yet. The bugs in the swamp in the summer months could be a horror story of their own. Around 7.30 pm we loaded the kayaks back into my pickup and headed all the way across the park to the launch area, as our guided paddle was supposed to start at 8. Part 3. We approached the launch area to unload and there was a good 15 to 20 other people going on the paddle. Led by a young enthusiastic ranger, we all slipped off into the water with our headlamps on the red light setting. We exit the small canal we had been traveling in and emerged out into a larger river-type waterway that meandered through the swamp. As we slowly and quietly creeped along, cypress trees draped with Spanish moss loomed over us on both sides, 
with a dramatic orange and pink sunset as their backdrop. The sun finally began disappearing and the stars started to come out. It was absolutely stunning and still one of my favorite kayaking memories. I'd never actually seen the Milky Way like that before. It was a new moon night, dark as could be. About a mile from our original launch, we all congregated out in the middle of the wide waterway and sat completely still and quiet. The motionless, dark waters of the swamp reflected the skies like a mirror. Thousands of stars and galaxies twinkled above us and below us, it was like being in space. Shooting stars were visible every few minutes. It really was magical, the only artificial light in the sky was the dull glow of Jacksonville, Florida on the horizon, which was about 100 miles to our southeast. After a while, the ranger snapped all of us out of our trances, it was time to head back. When we were paddling out there, it had been dusk or twilight for most of the trip, not much light, but enough to kind of silhouette the trees and branches against the sky, and a slight glimmer on the water. By now it was pitch black, and I do mean pitch black. The ranger told us to switch our headlamps back on, to their normal white light setting so that we could all see well enough to navigate out of the swamp. As each headlamp slowly switched on and the swamp was illuminated, we were met with hundreds of glowing eyes. Hundreds, I swear to you. Now, as I said earlier, I grew up out here. Gators were nothing new or scary to me at all. However, growing up we never really stayed out on the water past dark. We would shine our lights out over the water to look at all the eyes, but from dry land, far away from the beasts. Now, I found myself and my little family quite literally pushing past floating gators with our kayaks. They were absolutely everywhere, all over the sides of the channel as well as blocking our way in the center. The ranger was leading and assured everyone not to worry. He paddled up towards a huge group of shining eyes ahead of us and pushed right through them. Most of the eyes just disappeared under the water, but the gator directly in the ranger's path thrashed, and his tail actually hit the kayak. Holy shit y'all, sharp gasps from the group pierced the otherwise quiet southern night air, but the ranger showed zero signs of panic, which was reassuring. We all just trusted the young man that we weren't going to royally piss off these things by kayaking straight into them. As we went along, the sounds of gators being bumped by kayaks and thrashing were heard every couple minutes. There weren't any other jarring sounds or movements, just the constant calling of frogs, cicadas and the splashing of disturbed dinosaurs. When we finally turned back into the small channel that led to the launch, there were no more glowing eyes. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't been a bit freaked out, but I can honestly say I wasn't panicking. The ranger being so cool and confident while leading the way made it pretty easy to stay calm. Everyone started to relax again as we neared the launch, and we all got out, loaded up our boats and one by one headed back to our camps. There was a line of red tail lights trailing off toward the main campground, while my wife, daughter and myself split off, alone into the darkness towards the other side of the park where our site was. I do remember that feeling kind of eerie. But everyone had made it through the gator gauntlet safely with no problems, now we were laughing about it and remarking on how cool the whole experience was. We were in high spirits, no stress. We had no idea of the terror that would come later in the night. Part 4. We finally got back to our site around midnight and we were starving. I got a nice fire going while my wife prepped dinner. The meal finished cooking around 1 am and we finally all settled down to get comfy by the fire and eat. I hadn't taken two bites of my food when the horrifying experience began. The cicadas and frogs were singing, but you tend to drown that out into background noise because it's so constant. Suddenly, out of the calming buzz of their singing, sprung a sound that I will never forget. A low rumbling, guttural growl. Long, deep, vibrating in our chests. We all froze and looked at each other like, did y'all hear that shit? Not even 10 seconds later we hear it again. Yes, we all definitely heard that shit. It sounded close, really close. Like, right on the other side of the brush we were camped near. 
The only thing I could honestly relate it to at the time was the growling sound the T-Rex makes in Jurassic Park. I was. Terrified. I've been scared in the woods and the swamps. I've seen swamp gas, freaky figures, heard screams. I've been in the Marine Corps. I've encountered bears in the Appalachian Mountains. I've explored and experienced all kinds of places. When I tell you I have never been this scared, I mean it. Pure, raw, primordial fear. I immediately told the girls to get into the cab of my pickup. They get in the truck, and I hop into the bed of the truck with my little 357 Magnum drawn. I figured being back there would get me up off the ground, and give me a little advantage over whatever was coming. I told the girls to lock the doors and open the little sliding back window so we could communicate. I start frantically shining my flashlight around, aiming my gun along with it. I see absolutely nothing. We continue to hear the growling coming from one general direction, not getting any softer or louder, just continuously emitting in 3 to 5 seconds long intervals, every 30 seconds or so. It was coming from the brush right next to our site. I shine my light all over that area but I see nothing. Just thick palmetto leaves, underbrush and pine. No movement whatsoever. Then suddenly, we hear the sound coming from the complete opposite direction, more towards the open area of our sight. I whip around and shine my light that way, and that's when I noticed the dense fog that had settled onto the entire area. It was a damp, sticky, suffocating fog. Almost right away, the growling sound was coming back from the original direction, I whip around but immediately I hear it again behind me again. That's when I realized there were two of them, doing a kind of call and answer with each other. That's also when I realized that the other sounds of the swamp had gone silent. Nothing but the call and answer of whatever was making these absolutely gut-wrenching sounds. It got deafeningly quiet for a moment, nothing but the heavy fog which seemed to have a silent sound of its own. My wife, with shaky trembling voice, told me she wanted to leave immediately and that our daughter agreed. Now, I was absolutely terrified, do not misunderstand this, however, the thought of just leaving all of my expensive camping gear behind was somehow more offensive lol. Not to mention, I was getting kind of frustrated. I am at home in this damn swamp, I know all the creatures here, I'm comfortable here, it's borderline pissing me off that something out there has me so scared and confused. I start trying to rationalize what could be making this sound. Suddenly it started back up again but now it sounds like there could be four to five of them. All growling back and forth to each other, overlapping each other now, coming from all sides. A demonic chorus of deep, rattling, soul-sucking rumbles. Not getting any closer or farther away, just keeping us closely surrounded. If I'd had to shit I believe I would have shat myself. I kept myself at least somewhat cool by affirming that it must be animals of some kind, I wouldn't even entertain the thought of anything supernatural or cryptic, it's not that I don't believe in that stuff, I do. I was just trying not to freak out. My wife kept saying it sounded like a big cat, and while I agreed, I knew that just wasn't it. It would have had to be massive lions or tigers to make that kind of extremely low rumbling growl. Impossible. I racked my brain for the biggest animal it could be, and I just kept landing on alligator. Yet, we had just paddled directly through an entire swarm of them, some of them absolutely massive, and they hadn't made a single sound the whole time we were out on the water. No, that couldn't be it. I even had a thought that the young, playful ranger had orchestrated some kind of extravagant practical joke on us poor campers out here all alone. Really and truly I had no idea what it was, and not being able to even see a glimpse so I could take a shot at it to protect my family was a very helpless feeling. I really wish I had more words for how it felt, just blindly standing in the back of that truck, hearing what I could only imagine were the scariest, evilest, most vile things on the planet, just knowing that they wanted to kill, eat, or otherwise mutilate myself and my family. Part 5 it felt like an eternity but we'd probably only been holed up in my truck for 10 to 15 minutes by now. It had finally gone quiet again and I told the girls that we could leave, 
but am not leaving the gear. I climbed into the cab and started the truck and moved it, positioning it to where I could shine the headlights onto our stuff while I packed it all up. Gun in hand, I began rolling up the tent, gathering all of our crap and throwing it into the bed of the truck. Praying nothing crazy happened like my truck dying or some other perfectly timed, cinematic horror moment. I tried to put on a confident air so as not to scare my family, but in my head I felt so vulnerable, like I was something's prey. The growling still hadn't come back but honestly the silence was freaking me out more than anything. And the fog, I'll never forget how oppressive that fog felt. All of our gear was sopping wet with it and I swear it was hard to breathe the air. The fire was nothing but a smolder despite the fact that it had been roaring and bright 20 minutes ago. Just as I was rolling up the very last sleeping mat, one final, closer than before growl shook me to my core. I snatched that mat up and took off running, getting into the truck Dukes of Hazard style and taking the F off. None of us looked back. In the comments I will link a video of the sound that I found on YouTube, later that night back at home when we had cell service again. So, now that you've seen the video, you know what the sounds actually were? large male alligators. That sound is their mating call. The louder, lower and scarier sounding, the more the female gator finds it attractive. Those must have been the swamp's sexiest alligators because I had never heard this sound in all my life. I had been under the impression that I knew what their mating call sounded like from my childhood experiences in Okefenokee Joe's boat and with my father and uncle. These gators must have been absolutely massive to produce the sounds we were hearing, because it was nothing like what I'd ever heard in that swamp. It was exactly like that video, but I'm telling you, in person you can physically feel it rattling your insides. Though I was somewhat comforted by the fact that the noises were just gators flirting, and they weren't being aggressive towards us, my wife and daughter still think we were in danger because we were so close. I'm still not sure about that part. I got into Google Maps and tried to figure out exactly where we were camped, because from looking at the map the ranger had given us, we shouldn't have been that close to the water. I never could quite figure out where we'd ended up at. I don't know if it was us being in the wrong place, or the fact that the area hadn't had any human activity for two years, or a combination of both that put us so close to all of this mating activity that wouldn't normally happen near areas with lots of humans. Either way, it made for a heart-pounding experience that we still talk about to this day. Also, as a small funny addition to the story, looking back, the most hilarious thing was that my daughter was eating corn on the cob at the time we heard the first sound, and it was still in her hands. So during this entire event of being terrified and hearing these growls, she has a corn cob in her hand LMAO. I hope this wasn't too long, I enjoy writing and I just wanted to really set the tone and events of the night. I also hope my story wasn't a disappointment to the readers here, considering the ending has a definite answer and it was nothing really all that creepy after all. I can assure you though, that the fear and adrenaline in the moment were very very real. Imagine hearing that sound in the pitch black night of the Okefenokee swamp, and not knowing what it was. Looking back I suppose the fog settling in on us in the exact moment all the growling started was just a coincidence, but it sure did make the whole thing that much scarier. I will never forget the particular kind of fear I experienced that night. Lived 7 hours from my hometown during university. Would get rideshares on Craigslist. Did well over 75 by the time I'd done my 4 years. Here are my most memorable, worst ride shares. Once, a driver crashed into the car ahead of us at low speed on the freeway. We were okay. They had a baby on board, but ultimately, everyone was okay. Once, an old man picked me up in a beat up van and spent the whole ride trying to convince me to do DMT. Once, a guy pulled over on the freeway and popped open his trunk. He got out and pulled a rifle, then came to my passenger window and asked me if I wanted to walk into the field by the freeway and fire his rifle. I just said no, he put it back, and we resumed driving. Once, a woman picked me up. Riding in the front seat was this scraggly, 
bruised, tattooed guy who told me to call him Scum F. Steve. He had bandages from a knife fight he'd been in the other week. Apparently, he just walked out of the hospital. He talked about how he's part of the San Francisco Scum F and how if he'd met me anywhere else, he would have jumped my sorry white boy ass. Later during the ride, he pulled a nearly foot-long knife out of the glove box and just showed it to me. After that, the driver, a white girl, spent most of the ride trying to convince me to try to convince my girlfriend to smoke weed and have anal sex with me. She said she loved anal, and we'd made it better. Let's see. DMT man, crazy gun guy, dumbass baby driver, and scum F Steve. Those were the worst. I have recently become a veteran and have been searching for a new job. While waiting for news of an interview with a verified company, I went to Craigslist to find something else in the meantime, just in case the first one falls through. I wouldn't say Anchorage is a sketchy place, but anyone who lives here and has seen downtown will understand what I mean, it just seems off. I'm not sure what a similar city would be, as I used to live in a small town in Kansas previously, so this is new to me. On Wednesday morning, I received a call from the hiring professional of a company I had applied to through Craigslist. The ad didn't state the company's name, only that it was an office position dealing with international stocks. In the phone interview, the woman was vague and wouldn't reveal the name but said it was dealing with international stocks. She asked if I could meet for an interview with the manager on Friday at either 9 or 9.15. I opted for 9 since it was essentially the same either way. She gave me the address and said she couldn't wait to meet me. This morning, I got ready and placed the address in Google Maps and made my way there. It turns out that the location is one of the sketchier sides of downtown. I pulled into the parking lot where there was a large brown building with covered windows and two cars, along with a running white van. As I parked, a gentleman drove by me and rolled down his window, and I did the same. He asked, do you work here at ABC? A BC here could either be Alaskan Bush Company or something else, I don't know, and I told him I'm here for an interview. He replied, oh, you've got to go talk to the man in the white van behind you, and he'll take you up there. Immediately, I felt uncomfortable and thought it sounded sketchy. I told him that and he said, no, no, I'm not trying to put you in a bad place. I've already seen him taking up a lot of people there in nice suits. What's the worst that can happen? You go up there and the door locks behind you? Feeling uneasy, I thanked him for his time, and he left. I sat in my car and thought about it. I really need a job, but do I need to risk my safety? I try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not even that naive. I looked at the van parked behind me in the corner, and it's still running, but there are no windows on the side of the van and I can't see the person inside from where I'm parked. I decide to call my husband and ask him what I should do, and as soon as I say, I have to go talk to a guy in a van, he cuts me off and tells me to come home. So, it was pretty creepy, and I don't know if I'm blowing it out of proportion, but the situation raised too many red flags, especially with the first gentleman coming over to me as soon as I parked. It seemed too well-timed. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if it was a scam, and something terrible would have happened to me. I had just turned 15, and my parents had recently stopped spoiling me, which meant no free cash. I decided to do what they wanted and take some initiative by looking for a job. I found an ad on Craigslist for a job, which was taking care of some guy named Mark's house while he worked for the summer. The man looked and seemed normal enough, and the summer job paid really well, and so I decided to go and see how it goes. My mom dropped me off at his house and met with him, they talked and learnt more about each other since my mom wanted to get to know him, and then she left. For the first day, he stayed with me and showed me what I would have to do, which was mostly dusting, sweeping, vacuuming and taking care of the regular house chores. He left the next day, and everything went pretty well. 
I finished quickly, watched TV, ate some of the snacks he would put out for me. He would always come home at 7.30, and by then I would need to get the stuff ready for his dinner. After he would come home, pay me and give me some food to go. I did this for about a month, and was really racking up. I planned on doing this again next summer, but there was this one day, when he had left. It was one of my last few days, and I wanted to make it last. I finished up quickly, then took a bunch of his snacks, I don't know why I just did, and went snooping through his drawers. I really shouldn't have, but I'm glad I did. I found a few harmless items, like video cameras, images of normal things, sunsets, rivers. And then, things got weirder. There were images of children, my age, working, sweeping, cooking, using the bathroom. And then it got worse. Pictures of me, in the bathroom, of me taking a nap. I searched through more of his drawers and found CDs, all labeled with different names, along with flash drives, also labeled. Five of them had my name on it. He had been videotaping me. I walked around, all over his house and searched every wall, bathroom, the basement, all the bedrooms. I found 11 cameras, but by then I had stopped looking. I checked the last bathroom, and this is where things got pretty real if they weren't real enough. The camera was on. It was the type of ones used for security, with the red flashing light used for when it was on. I stared up at it, then stuck up my middle finger and left. I went back to his room and gathered every photograph, every CD, every flash drive and anything I could find to arrest him, and I left the house. I didn't have any way to get home, so I walked to the nearest shop and called my mom, and then the police. The guy was charged and arrested for multiple felonies, but that was all I was told. I'm guessing one of them was possession of child pornography, but I don't want to know what the other ones are. I live in a four-bedroom apartment downtown, after graduating college. Myself and a couple of brothers from Omega Pi Epsilon went halfsies on a cheap place. There's me, David, although everyone calls me Trip because I have a third nipple. Okay, not really, but I do have a mole near my left nipple that the guys call my Trip Nip. There's Chad, who we call Captain Ahab because that dude is obsessed with fat girls, aka. Wales. Preston, or Little League got his name because my man sleeps with a baseball bat in the sheets with him. Says it's for home security but all he's ever done with it is get super drunk and hit beer cans off the roof. Lastly there's Duke, who is known only as Squirts, unfortunately for you the history of that name is classified Omega Pi Epsilon knowledge. We just graduated pretty recently, and none of us really have savings or jobs that make that much money. Little League's dad has been bankrolling him for a while, but he refuses to chip in any extra on the bills we split, so the budget is tighter than a religious girl's butthole. That being said, we've managed to turn our little shithole of an apartment into a nice-ish bachelor pad. Captain Ahab's brother worked at a bar that closed so he hooked us up with several choice neon beer signs. I had a pong table that I bought from Spencer's a few years back, it doesn't light up anymore but it still has a pretty cool neon design. We have a few beanbag chairs that we got from the rec room at school when they changed out the furniture. The only thing we didn't have was a couch. That's why I turned to Craigslist. I know, getting a couch off of Craigslist is a little shady, but we're balling on a budget. I found a few couches for sale, but they were all ugly old lady couches. When I switched over to the free page though I found something perfect. A blue suede couch for free only about a half hour away. I called the number listed and confirmed that it was still available. The man I talked to was super chill, even offered to bring it over to our place since he was planning on taking it to the dump anyway. About an hour later this big pickup pulled up, I could see the blue of the couch poking out under the tarp. The guy I spoke to on the phone introduced himself as Bill and helped me unload it into our living room. Nice guy. I gave him a natty light for the road. We've had the couch in the living room for a few weeks now. 
It's pretty comfy and the blue kind of matches the blue tint of the biggest beer sign, which is pretty sick. I was sure that the next time I brought a chick home she would totally dig the atmosphere. The only problem is that our living room has this funny smell to it now. After investigating I realized the offensive odor was coming from the couch. At first I thought that maybe it was just the smell of the previous owner's house but it seemed to be getting stronger. It's been cold outside though so we've been cranking the heat, I brushed it off as the various smells of four bachelors sitting on it with their sweaty balls. I'm pretty sure Captain Ahab done that big girl who's been hanging around on it too, so that probably didn't help. I've been febreezing it as much as possible, hoping that it would cover up the stank, and it does for a few hours but then the smell comes back, stronger than before. A few nights ago we had a party. Tons of people. Not as many chicks as I had originally hoped but there were a few hotties and a few sixes who quickly turned into eights after several drinks. I picked one who seemed mildly interested and partnered up with her for Pong. Bad call. She couldn't chug, kept gagging, so the other team kept scoring on us and I got wasted after a few rounds, although the Jaeger bombs in the kitchen afterwards probably didn't help much either. I don't know if I scored with Amanda? Ashley? It started with an A, or an E Aaron? Whatever. I'm inclined to believe that I did not however because I woke up face down on the beanbag chair. When I opened my eyes, hung over as shit, I rolled over to see Captain Ahab sprawled on the couch, leg over the back. It looked like even if I didn't get lucky Captain did, there was a huge dip in the couch, probably from all that glorious whale blubber banging against the cushions. I decided to grab a shower. I stumbled to the bathroom and peeled off my Omega Pi Epsilon Gets It On, Flip Cup Champions 2015 t-shirt, shorts and boxers before jumping in and turning on the water. I was the first one up so the water was still hot. It was nice, really nice, so nice that I spent longer than necessary in there thinking about Aaron? Emma? A whatever, that I, maybe? Hooked up with. When I got out I grabbed a towel and dried off my hair before toweling my arms and legs and wrapping it around my waist. I brushed my teeth and gargled, spitting or the water I checked the mirror to see if I looked hungover. I did. I grabbed a leftover drink from last night, I think it was mine, it was in my pimp chalice, and took a big chug. Don't judge, a little hair of the dog never hurts. Then I headed out to the living room where Captain was sitting up groggily. Hey big fella, I said softly, looks like someone caught a whale last night. Shut the F up, trip. He moaned holding his head. You dude, what the F is that? I asked pointing at his arm, it was covered in splotchy red marks. What? He muttered, holding his arm or to look. I noticed it on his face as well. F man, I don't know. He grumbled before standing up. Shower free? Yeah. Go wash that stank off of you, I laughed before downing the rest of my drink. I figured that there must have been some detergent or something on the couch that caused the rashes so I went over to it to see what I could do. It looked like someone had spilled a drink or two on the cushions, either that or Captain Ahab pissed himself. Lifting up the cushions to see if the covers came off for washing I realized they were heavy as hell, soaking wet. I wondered what happened the night before. Maybe we got a little crazier than I realized. As I tossed the cushions on the ground the smell was overwhelming, worse than it had ever been. I looked underneath the cushions at the back of the couch and was overwhelmed with nausea. Crawling underneath the cushions near the crack of the couch were a couple dozen maggots, wriggling and squirming across the fabric. Overcome with disgust and stomach filled with beer, Red Bull and Jaeger I went to the bathroom and vomited. Profusely. Nastiest shit I think I've ever seen. I shouted at Captain through the shower curtain, downed a bottle of Gatorade, gotta keep up those electrolytes, son, and threw a t-shirt on over my nose. I put the cushions back on the couch and propped open the front door. Captain threw on clothes and met me in the living room, together we lugged the stinkiness out of our apartment into the dumpster. About halfway there we heard a thud and the couch got a lot lighter. Looking down at the ground we saw what was smelling. Laying on the parking lot pavement, sprawled almost at my feet was a goddamn human body. 
We threw the couch down and booked it back inside. I've called the police and they haven't managed to identify the body nor what it died from, but they didn't say that it looked like a murder, more likely natural causes. The post on Craigslist has been removed and I passed along a description of the guy who brought over the couch and his phone number to the cops, although they say that it appears to be disconnected. After the police left, Captain threw up in and said he needed to lay down. I'm kind of worried about the guy, because he's barely left his room the last few days and the rashes seem to have gotten worse, blistering even. He doesn't have health care either since his dad lost his job last month and Little League refuses to help pay for him to go to the hospital. Anybody know what he could have? Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.